Okay, welcome back uh, after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we began looking at uh, First Timothy chapter 6. We're looking at verse 1 and 2. And uh, we're trying to help uh, Say answer and answer Say's question. So basically, Say, in these verses, uh, we see that Paul is writing to um, bond servants. So he's basically addressing uh, or he's calling upon slaves uh, you know, to count their masters worthy of all honor uh, and to be good and respect, you know, good, respectful workers for their, to be good, respectful um, uh, workers for their masters. So uh, uh, in, in this case, you know, it does, uh, 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 Paul is writing this not out of a general, you know, kind of an approval of the whole institution of uh, slavery, but he's talking about how slaves uh, should, uh, you know, uh, count their masters worthy of all honor. And in that sense, he's saying, you know, when you do that, you know, it will bring glory uh, to God and his, uh, you know, uh, and the doctrine of God will not be blasphemed. God and his doctrine will be not uh, blasphemed among the uh, people. Uh, so here in this passage, yes, Paul is specifically speaking to slaves um, uh, who serve their masters. Uh, but we also see that Paul, uh, in many other places, he talks about, uh, uh, you know, how uh, slaves have to work for their masters, how they have to respect them, work under them, uh, and all of those things. So we also see that nowhere in scripture, like, you know, it's, it, it, generally talks about how a slavery should be abolished and all of those things because we read also in the old testament uh, you know god giving them laws about uh, you know uh, after 6 years how slaves are supposed to be set free if uh, if their master wanted to set them free or if the slave wants to continue working for their master then you know uh, they commit for life by piercing their ear um, we also see Paul writing, uh, you know, and giving various uh, regulations of for slavery uh, through his writings um, for the institution of slavery and the regulations that need to be followed in the church who are slaves are, uh, and slaves are also part of the church. He writes this in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Colossians chapter 3. So, uh, yes, you know, um, uh, nowhere in scripture we see that, you know, directly talking about abolishing of uh, a slavery, but uh, Christianity has led in, uh, you know, abolishing the whole, uh, 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 you know, uh, the whole thing about uh, slavery, slave trade. But uh, reading what different commentators have to say about slavery in, uh, in the Roman world, you know, there are about six million uh, slaves in the Roman Empire and uh, slavery in the Roman Empire was uh, like a common institution and uh, they also say that uh, you know uh, slaves uh, held every type of position some of them were teachers doctors artists uh, musicians um, you know anything that you can think of so Basically, some were born into slavery, some sold themselves into slavery to pay off their debts, so some forcibly taken into slavery. But what, why is Paul uh, writing uh, this? Uh, the church setup is because, you know, church, uh, the church ministered to pe people in various uh, 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 social standings, ministered to masters, ministered to slaves. They were part of the church. And so he's basically talking how, uh, you know, a slave and a master should conduct themselves in the church. So did that help, Say? It beats, um, but, but it's OK. Sorry? Kind of, in a way. I, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's just I'm I'm also just trying to I'm trying to put myself in a situation whereby someone brings this up and I'm trying to explain it in a way um, that 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 shows that Christianity was never a justification for slavery. I, I just I understand what you're saying perfectly, but I'm just trying to still also make meaning of why. Um, you know why? Why nothing was ever said on slavery? 
since it was never God's design, I know, but I, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> but but I, I think it's it's okay. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, you know, Scripture never sought the abolishment of slavery as an institution in the uh, ancient world. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, we see that uh, uh, there were slaves. Abraham had slaves. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Israelites had slaves and peop uh, God had laws for the, the slaves as well. Um, so, um, you know, and uh, like I just said, what uh, God said in Exodus chapter uh, 21 verses 2 to 6 and even Paul is writing about uh, regulations for uh, slavery as an institution in various places so yes you know uh, it never sought the abolishment of slavery but uh, uh, had other positive things to say and how slaves could you know respond to their masters uh, so in our context, of course, you know, the church had a major role to play. Christianity had a major role to play. Uh, Christians had a major role to play in abolishment of uh, slavery, uh, which God brought it about in his own time. Um, uh, but yes, you know, uh, even now, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, yes, employees, you know, how can we relate to our masters? Uh, some of us are still uh, under slavery, so to say, under various institutions, we're under various things. Even though we live in a free country, sometimes the way we work for other countries, we are like slaves to them, you know, in that context, yes. But, um, yeah, that's about it, I can say. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we'll continue. So, um, um so in our context, like I explained how, you know, we as employees have to honor and respect our employers so that, you know, God's name and his doctrine, the church uh, as well is not blasphemed or is not talking, uh, spoken about in a wrong way. Okay. And then he goes on to say that those who are believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and are and beloved teach exhort these uh, things so he's saying that um, you know like i said uh, you know for those who are uh, slaves who are having believing masters it's easy for them to say that you know uh, they should not expect their masters to uh, you know, expect them to work hard uh, or they, uh, you know, because they are brothers in Christ um, uh, and also that their master should favor them. Just like, you know, we work for an, um, uh, 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 an employer who is a believer, then we need to expect, uh, you know, our employer to favor us, to, you know, uh, allow us uh, time to just go whenever we want to go for fasting prayer or for church activities or for uh, take leave for uh, mission work or uh, ministry related work. Hey, but if, you know, if there is um, uh, a project that is assigned to us and there is work assigned to us and there's a deadline that we have to meet, we just can't give an excuse and expect our boss to think that and, uh, uh, you know, accept our uh, excuse and favor us saying that, hey, you know, we had to go for a, a prayer meeting or I had to go for a mission trip or, you know, I had to go for a hospital visit and pray for somebody who's sick or minister to somebody who had no family to take care of them, was in the hospital with them. You know, but, you know, uh, 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 this is where we get our bread and butter and our um, uh, the work that is assigned to us helps in the overall work of the project and if that project gets shelved if, if that project is not accepted then there's no income coming in it's going to affect the uh, 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 the, the the owner of the place the master the our employer it affects all of us who are uh, looking up you know to them to uh, for our bread and butter and so it's you know we can't just make excuses uh, but if we serve a, a brother in christ uh, somebody who is in christ and we uh, you know we need to uh, be all the more committed all the more dedicated work all the more hard for them uh, you know and so he's saying slaves uh, in this matter you need to be dedicated sincere faithful and not uh, expect any favors and uh, not try to show your authority in uh, uh, at home or wherever you are working for uh, an employer you need to be faithful sincere and um, committed and should never expect special treatment uh, because our boss is a super 
supervisor or our supervisor is a Christian. Uh, instead, you know, we should be motivated to work all the more harder uh, because we can be a blessing uh, to another brother uh, or another sister in, in the body of um, Christ. So serve well wherever God has placed you. Uh, don't take advantage, uh, you know, and be faithful and committed. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy to teach and exhort these things, even as he's spoken about uh, uh, how a leader should be, the qualifications of a leader, when it comes to widows and the uh, responsibilities of, uh, of people in the family. And now he's talking about uh, uh, slaves and uh, masters. Okay, so he says, this is how you should... Uh, um, uh, work in the workplace and so he's saying teach this exhort uh, them uh, uh, exhort from the pulpit teach the, the church about all of these uh, things verses three to five he talks about words of truth so uh, can somebody read that please verses three to five read if any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and stripes of words, whereof commit envy, strife, railings, evil submissions, perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind, and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Amen. Thank you, Say. So here, uh, as Paul is closing his letter, uh, coming to the close of his letter, he's again uh, talking about or uh, referring to what he mentioned in the first part of his uh, letter, the chapter one. And he's telling Timothy, be on guard against people who misuse the word of God, uh, you know, teach the false uh, doctrines, use the word of God to bring about their own false teachings and doctrines uh, that would kind of... Uh, you know, support their own evil lifestyles and their gain for uh, money. So he says, if anyone teaches otherwise, which means in this context means, a, uh, you know, replacing the plain teaching of God's word uh, with a focus on prophecy and visions and strange, you know, spiritual experiences that people claim to have had, you know, uh, this is a great danger. And so Paul is warning Timothy against this. And he says, um, you know, uh, uh, and anyone who teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome uh, words. So Paul is warning Timothy against those who left uh, the word of God or, uh, you know, who have shipwrecked their faith, who've gone away and are trying to promote their own ideas. Uh, and he says, who do not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. So there are different people, uh, you know, who do not consent to the truth in God's word. They do this in different ways. Uh, there are different ways that people do not consent to the truth in God's word. Some deny God's word. Some ignore God's word. Some can explain away God's word according to what they want. They think they feel uh, how they want to live to accommodate their own sinful lifestyles. And also some twist God's word using it, you know, as something they can play around with uh, just to, you know, discuss and have debates and uh, disputes with um, others. And he's saying that such people, uh, he's saying, uh, are proud. Um, you know, uh, uh, he is proud knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over um, words. So such people, you know, he describes such people who misuse God's word. Uh, he's saying that even though they are proud, they don't see or admit uh, to their lack of knowledge of what they are saying or what they're speaking about. And like most proud people, you know, they're able to convince others uh, that they are, you know, experts of God's truth, and uh, uh, when they are actually misusing uh, God's uh, word, His truth, uh, to you know bring about their own teaching, their own thoughts, their own knowledge, and to you know uh, their own lifestyles. And then he says, "What is the fruit of such people? 
uh, who you know uh, are proud who you know do not consent to the word of truth uh, do not give in to the wholesome truth in god's word you know what is the fruit of such people he says the fruit of them is disputes and arguments so all of this just basically ends in disputes and arguments um so um you know, and uh, he says there's there'll be envy, strife, uh, uh, reveling, and evil uh, suspicions. So he says, you know, Paul is telling Timothy that the presence of such people in the church uh, who are trying to, you know, deviate from the truth in God's word, not giving consent to the wholesome truth in God's word, who are proud, uh, they think they know everything, but they know nothing, you know, their presence in the church. Uh, you know, will give rise to all kind of division and discontent, and it ultimately will bring a lot of damage and strife and disorder in the church. Therefore, Paul is warning Timothy, you know, withdraw from uh, such people, have nothing to do with uh, such people. And he uses this word, uh, useless uh, wranglings. If you look at the NKJV, it says useless uh, wranglings basically means endless and needless discourses you know they have endless and needless uh, arguments and uh, discussions uh, basically this word wranglings if you look at it in the greek uh, it signifies maddening and angering uh, discussions and disputes so you know the end result of this kind of discussion ends in a dispute where everybody is mad and angry uh, or it also signifies something like this you know when uh, when sheep when you know they're infected with some skin infection and it kind of uh, you know there's a wound there and it's covered up and it's dry and you know the sheep goes and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, scrapes themselves or you know rub themselves against another sheep you know trying to uh, uh, you know break out that uh, dryness that itchiness uh, uh, it, it just spreads the infection. So what he's basically saying here is that you know, these people just go around doing these, talking these things, discussing these things, but, you know, it's just like an infection spreading. And the end result is just every, everybody getting mad and angry and it's bringing about envy, strife and evil, uh, you know, and uh, disturbance in the church and, uh, you know, a division in the uh, church and he said goes on to say that these people who do these things uh, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain so another characteristic of these uh, uh, false teachers or these people who are going around uh, teaching wrong doctrines he's saying another characteristic is that uh, you know um, uh, those who misuse God's word, the truth in God's word, their interest is not exactly in the truth in God's word. They're not interested uh, in improving the truth in God's word of making their truth known uh and you know uh, their their uh, their plan is not for god's glory but they are motivated partly by their desire for wealth and comfort so you know uh, even as they draw people away from the truth they're not interested whether they know the truth what is the truth you know if they are speaking the truth they're not interested in all of those things what they are interested in is, is just, you know, drawing people away uh, so, you know, they can uh, uh, make money, uh, they can acquire wealth and, you know, live a comfortable uh, life. So such people think that godliness is a means for making people, uh, sorry, uh, godliness is a means for making money and, uh, you know, uh, Paul is telling Timothy, stay away from such uh, people. You know, we can be godly and have money uh we can uh, be godly and make money which is also okay it's not uh, wrong for us to be godly and have wealth or riches or money it's not uh, ungodly for us uh, to you know be godly and uh, make money you know uh, business and multiply uh, the money that god has entrusted to us it's it's a good thing but you know we must not use our godliness or uh, our walk of faith uh, uh, as a means to make money for ourselves, which means, you know, not using God's word uh, as like a peddler, you know, peddling it to make money, uh, to make ourselves rich and acquire uh, wealth. And so 
Paul is very strictly telling Tim Timothy, you know, uh, don't associate with such people uh, who present the gospel with this kind of a uh, marketing approach. And then in verses 6 to 10, he goes on to talk about godliness with contentment. So can somebody please read uh, verses 6 to 10, please? Can I read, Pastor? Yes, thank you, Asha. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with us, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So here uh, he's saying, uh, Paul is telling Timothy that, you know, he's already told him that those who misuse God's word wrongly uh, think that godliness is a means of material gain. But uh, knowing that the statement might be misunderstood you know he Paul follows it up with an explanation he says that godliness with contentment is great gain so it's true that godliness is great gain yes but only accompanied by contentment so what is contentment uh, you know contentment is basically when you're satisfied with what uh, you have or when we are satisfied with what we have and Paul knew this kind of uh, contentment uh, firsthand uh, because, you know, he writes about it or he testifies about this in Philippians 4 verses 11 to 13 where he says, not that I speak in regard to need for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and how uh, I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens uh, me. Okay, so Paul uh, you know, himself is uh, testifying to the fact that, uh, you know, he knows, you know, whatever state that he is in, you know, whether he has plenty or he has lack, you know, how to be content uh, in any and every uh, situation. So, you know, it's true that uh, material possessions in and of themselves is not uh, something that will corrupt us. Uh, Paul could abound in material things and yet, you know, still keep uh, it all in proper perspective. Uh, so uh, in that sense, you know, we can find uh, contentment only when our hearts are rooted in eternal things. So, you know, even Paul, when he had plenty, uh, he was content. Even when he lacked, you know, even in that situation, he was content. Why? Because his heart was rooted in eternal uh, things. So when our heart is rooted in the things of God, in eternal things, our perspective is an eternal perspective, uh, then, you know, then and then only can we find contentment in any and everything that uh, we have or we will acquire in this um, life. So contentment is essential, um, uh, you know, because it shows us we are living with an eternal perspective. So when we're living contented lives, whether we have plenty or lack, it's basically showing that we are living with an eternal perspective, that when we lack, we know God will provide for us. And when we have plenty, that he has blessed us. And then Paul goes on to talk how those who are rich, you know, what they should do, how they can help others, how they can bless others with what God has uh, blessed them. So godliness, you know, in that sense, really can bring uh, you know, uh, contentment, but before it can, you know, uh, we need to be transformed in a renewing of a mind, like we studied in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, we need to start putting material things in their proper priority uh, next to spiritual things, uh, which means that we can find, uh, need to know that we can only find contentment in our hearts when we, our heart is rooted in eternal things. And that contentment is essential because it shows us that we are living uh, in an eternal uh, perspective. So these two things that we need to keep in mind, you know, um, 
living with an eternal perspective and also that our heart is rooted in eternal things so when we are rooted in eternal things and we are living with an eternal perspective you know we will be content in any and every uh, situation and then he goes on to say that we brought nothing into this world and it's certain that we can carry nothing out of it uh, so it's very simple uh, this uh, this verse but just want to say that you know but we can send things ahead uh, for our, uh, we can send ahead eternal blessing and reward uh, to the wise use of our resources that God has blessed us right now. So even as God has blessed us with various resources right now, the way that we use it, you know, uh, can uh, actually send ahead eternal blessings and reward uh, uh, ahead of us so that we know that, you know, the way we have been good stewards of what God has entrusted, we are going to receive a, a reward. Even though we don't carry anything out of this world, but, you know, what we have, how we have used our resources, how we've been good stewards of what God has given to us, you know, um, uh, enables us or puts us in a place where we can uh, benefit in our eternal life, where we can receive eternal blessings and um, a reward. He says, um, you know, in verse 8, and having food and clothing with these, uh, we shall be uh, content. Uh, you know, when we have an eternal perspective, a heart of content, uh, content, uh, contentment, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is a heart that is uh, desiring eternal things, then, uh, you know, it's a heart which is humble uh, and a heart that is content and a heart that is humble, uh, you know, will be content with simple things and not just longing for uh, more and more things. So two important things we need to uh, live with an eternal perspective and a heart that is rooted in eternal things. And when we do that, you know, we will have a humble heart and, uh, uh, and finally it will be a heart that will be content with even uh, simple things. Okay, we'll move on to verses 9 and 10 before we move on. Anyone has any questions? Okay, any thoughts, any questions? Okay, thank you, Kennedy, for summarizing that. Do not take undue advantage of our brotherhood, but strive for godly contentment. Thank you. Okay, uh, yes, Christopher. Uh, yes, Pastor. So, so sometimes there is uh, this, uh, uh, this scenario where the... Uh, the people in the church, uh, you know, are have this um, this wrong attitude that, you know, if they give money uh, to a church, you know, they are in a way, you know, buying their <laughs> buying their way to to heaven, uh, or uh, and uh, they will also kind of try to, uh, you know, uh, link that offering. Sorry, Christopher, we lost you. Can't hear you. Are you unable to hear Christopher? No, Pastor. Okay. Maybe his, uh, his connection is not good. Anyway, when he comes back, we'll continue to hear what he has to say. But we'll move on to verses 9 and 10. Uh, can somebody please read uh, verses 9 and 10, please? But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harm, harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and partition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from faith in, in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay, uh, men, thank you, Kung. Um, so here, you know, those who desire to be uh, rich, so the desire for riches is far more dangerous than riches themselves. So here it's not saying, you know, you should not be rich or you should not have riches or you should not have wealth. No, here it's talking about the desire to be uh, rich. So the desire to be rich is more dangerous than riches themselves. And it isn't only the poor who desire to be rich. Sometimes we think only poor people, those who lack things, you know, they desire to be rich, but also the rich can desire to be 
even more richer okay or the rich can desire to be uh, uh, to acquire more riches so it's not here just talking about poor people it can even talk about um, uh, rich people um, but also here we need to know that it's not uh, riches is not wrong in itself um, because God uh, you know desires to pour out his blessing and his pour out his riches on us but here it's the desire for riches to become more and more uh, rich and wealthy and acquire more and more uh, things and he says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a uh, so he says that this desire for riches is what tempts our heart away uh, from uh, the eternal perspective, our heart from eternal things, and it uh, it kind of ens uh, ensnares us or en enslaves us. It's like a trap, uh, and we find it very difficult to uh, escape. So even as we read in scripture, you know, uh, it says that uh, you know sometimes we always blame Satan for tempting us, but uh, the Word of God says, you know, uh, uh, it's when it our own desires we are tempted and led astray and then we are caught uh, we are drawn into that and we are uh, you know uh, uh, we are in a trap that uh, you know eventually we are not able to set ourselves free from it and we end up sinning and in uh, death okay so here it's again talking about our desire and it's our desire to be rich that gets us into uh, into all kinds of uh, uh, temptations and uh, you know it draws our heart away from eternal riches and ensnares us traps us uh, and you know um, uh, and you know we uh, we fall into sin and then we can go away from our faith and uh, end up in uh, eternal uh, death so always dreaming of riches always setting our heart on riches is a heart that is desiring for riches for wealth and for money which can lead into all kind of uh, temptations and he says however if you desire to be rich you know and you don't have uh, you know uh, uh, godliness with contentment then actually you're set we are setting ourselves up to fall into temptations into all kind of harmful lusts or desires uh, which can lead to ruin which can lead to destruction which can lead to prediction which means which can lead to eternal damnation eternal uh, death so here are two important things you know uh, to avoid uh, desire to be rich and godliness with uh, no godliness with contentment you know we are setting ourselves up uh, to fall into temptation where we can fall into every kind of harmful desires and lusts and to uh, which will lead us into every kind of destruction and ruin and to eternal uh, damnation and he says the love of money it's not money in itself that is wrong here he's saying again the desire or the love for money the greed for money you know, desiring after more money how to make more money how to make more money you know the love for money which is basically talking about greediness and desire to be rich um, gives birth to all kind of evil and has even caused people to stray away so we need to check our hearts uh, this morning you know uh, to check our hearts and see if uh, you know uh, is our heart uh, really uh, you know content with what God has uh, blessed us with is our heart rooted in eternal things are we living with an eternal perspective or is our heart just desiring for uh, more of riches more of wealth more of the things of this world and then we know the consequences of it because that is what he uh, uh, you know uh, speaks about or, or share, uh, writes about in verses 9 and verse 10 because he says those who have strayed away from the faith in their greediness pierce themselves with many uh, sorrows so it's not that you know it's come upon us but we have brought it upon our own uh, lives okay and then he goes on to talk about the life of a man of God in verses 11 to 16 so can somebody please read verses 11 to 16 please verses 11 to 16 can I read pastor yes thank you Asha as for the rich in this present age charge them not to be haughty no nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on God, 
who, are, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Uh, Pastor, would you like me to read the 16th one? Yes, please. Who alone has immortality, who dwells an unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So here uh, Paul is saying, but you, O man of God. So he's uh, telling Timothy, you know, uh, even as he's commanded Timothy to be different from those who uh, live for riches and for material world wealth, he's saying, you know, uh, that Timothy has to flee, uh, you know, these proud arguments and from uh, and of those who misuse God's word and who, who suppose that, you know, uh, we should follow God just for what we can get out of uh, it. So he says, we flee from such people, have nothing to do with them. And in the view of these potential dangers uh, and how some abuse the faith uh, for making their own personal gains, Paul is admonishing Timothy to flee, which means, you know, uh, run quickly, uh, you know, speedily, uh, get away from such things, have nothing to do with them, don't even discuss, don't even argue, don't even get into a discussion with them, uh, just flee or just run, uh, have just have basically have nothing uh, to do with them. And says instead, you know, uh, of pride and riches, which he has just talked about, the pride of these um, false teachers and, uh, you know, the, the gain, the personal gain they want to make through their uh, teaching. So he says, instead of gain and riches, uh, he's telling Timothy, you know, what are the things he must pursue? So he's saying, you know, we need to, you need to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, uh, and gentleness. And, you know, some of these things are often not valued in our present age, but we see that in scripture, we read this in scripture, and even as it's in scripture, we know that this is very valuable to God. And so we need to pursue a right living, a right standing before God. We need to pursue godliness in every area, uh, you know, live by faith and not by sight, you know, pursue love, patience, and uh, gentleness. So it's so important for us as ministers of God and as believers, you know, to guard ourselves from uh, the love of money and from every kind of pride, every kind of false teaching, um, you know, using God's word to just accommodate our sinful lifestyles. Instead, we need to focus on righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. And then he says, you know, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. So he says, fight the good fight, keeping a firm grip on what is eternal. So just like I said, you know, we need to keep, have an eternal perspective in mind, uh, in our heart, hold on to eternal things. So it says, fight the good fight of uh, faith. So what Paul is telling Timothy is, um, you know, even as you follow God's uh, word, even as you walk in God's ways, you know, you are uh, going against the flow of this world and it's not going to be easy. You're going to face a lot of difficulties, but he's telling Timothy to have a soldier's determination, just like he's spoken in the previous chapters. He says, you know, be determined as a soldier because you're a soldier of Christ. You know, be determined, uh, you know, go on the way that God has uh, called you, set apart for you, you know, walk in that way. And he says, in the sight of God who gives... Um, um, uh, life to all things. So, uh, you know, since Paul called Timothy uh, to a difficult battle, you know, and he's telling him you need to fight this battle as a good soldier, uh, it was also important for Timothy to know that these orders were given to him by this great eternal God. That's why he says, fight the good fight of faith, hold on to eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed a good confession in the presence of many um, uh, witnesses. And he says, I urge you in the sight of God, you know, who gives life to all um, 
things. So he's saying it's going to be difficult, Timothy, but you know, you can, uh, you have these orders from this great God, and he's giving uh, him, you know, uh, uh, two things to hold on to. The first thing he's saying, you know, hold on to God who gives life uh, to all things. And the second one is Christ Jesus who, wit uh, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius uh, Pilate. So he says, Timothy, you have an obligation to serve uh, your creator, your maker who gave you life. And, uh, you know, he's uh, pointing Timothy uh, and us as well, you know, as uh, believers, he's pointing us uh, to, uh, to God who gives us life, who sustains us, and also to Christ who set the example for us uh, himself by not going back on his call, his purpose, his testimony, even in even when he was brought before Pontius Pilate, uh, and you know, um, you know, and, and, and just Paul is pointing out to this, and he says, even as Christ did not, you know, held on to his confession, his call, his purpose, his destiny, even though he know he knows he's going to be uh, crucified, he holds on to his call, his purpose, and his destiny, and also points out. Uh, to his exalt, Christ's exalted position and soon uh, return. And he's saying, in the view of this, you know, pursue what is eternal and hold fast uh, to your confession of faith. Okay. Uh, we'll stop here. We just have one minute. We we'll listen to what Christopher has to say. Yes, Christopher, you had something to say? Ah, yes, Pastor. Sorry, I lost connection. No, yeah, I was no just worries. saying that uh, sometimes there is a uh, there is a wrong attitude which is uh, shown by uh, by some people who who uh, make offerings, uh, feeling that you know, the offering can be linked to uh, you know their um, their uh, their safe passage to to heaven, and uh, you know or their you know that is a that's a good deed that they have that they have made, um, and. Uh, they also, you know, in a sense, um, make that quite, um, uh, you know, obvious uh, to to the church or to the church leaders, and um, uh, so in that scenario, will the, should the uh, should the pastor or the you know person in charge uh, should he take the offering or explain, you know, that that this this uh, this this offering cannot be linked to that? Uh, it's 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 uh, you know it's what. Uh, they 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 uh, you know they want to give, but it cannot be linked to you know some good deed that uh, you know that is that is uh, seen as uh, you know a way to get to heaven. Yeah, so it's, I just wanted some some clarification on that. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, the pastor uh, preaches and teaches about this, and also communicates um, uh, this truth uh, to the person because. It's not their good works is going to take them, give them salvation and take them to heaven. It's their uh, faith in uh, in Christ Jesus. Yes, it's important. Yeah, and uh, taking the offering, I think it would help uh, not taking it if it's you know personally the person is handing it over, but if the person is already put it in the offering box and then coming to the pastor and sharing, then I think the pastor can. A mentor that person and help that person understand, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the truth in God's word, uh, what the Bible teaches us, and uh, you know, get them to a place where they can um, share their, you know, they they can uh, uh, accept uh, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But it can take time; it's a process. Uh, but we uh, should not do anything that can hurt the person. But you can say, I mean, for the time being, I would want to take it i like you to keep it with your uh, with you uh you know i won't take this offering but i like you to consider and think about it and uh, you know uh, and we can discuss further and you can help the person you know understand and see through and things like that yes All right thank you yeah thank you uh christopher anyone else has any questions any thoughts Anything you'd like to share? No? OK. Uh, thank you all for joining class. Uh, have a blessed day and a blessed week. Thank you for your patience through uh, these. Thank you.
last three hours. Thank you very much. Okay, have a good day, everyone. God bless. Bye bye. Thank you, Master. Thank you.